Hello and welcome to this video on section 5.1, optimization problems, and this is for our math 1431 Calc 1 course here at the University of Houston. Okay, before getting started with the math material here, I just want to point out again a couple of the really important notes. This material will appear on homework and quizzes, um, but it will not appear on any exams for the remainder of our semester. So this will not um, be tested on any exams. Um, another note about this material is that it is sort of an extension or really an application of what we talked about in chapter three. So in chapter three, we spent a lot of time discussing the first derivative and local extreme values, right? And then we also talked about global extreme values. Um, and we even used the second derivative. Of course, we used it to talk about concavity, but we also used it to um, classify these local things as maxes or mins. So a lot of this work, right, was um, taking a function, computing its derivative, setting it equal to zero, or figuring out where it doesn't exist, solving for all these critical numbers, and then testing these critical points. And chapter or section 5.1 is going to involve all of this calculus stuff. But first, we'll have to come up with the function. Um, and we'll need to um, examine sort of a little more carefully the critical points. So what's going to happen is we're going to be given like a word problem, some sort of applied sounding question. And we'll need to come up with a function that we're trying to make biggest or smallest. And we'll have to look at the critical points where maybe this happens and see if they're meaningful for our word problem. OK, so in terms of calculus, there's not necessarily new calculus involved in this material. But there is sort of a new mathematical muscle you might want to practice developing with this material. And that is sort of like what we did with related rates that's reading a word problem and converting it into math. Okay, so let's maybe start with an example. Example one says, suppose you want to fence in a rectangular shaped region. All right, so this is the way our word problem is starting off. So we want to fence in a rectangular shaped region. Um, and we're doing it along the straight edge of a river. Right, that's so along the straight edge of a river. The side along the river does not need to be fenced. In addition, the region will be subdivided into two parts. So the region will be subdivided into two parts. The fencing material that will be used for the three sides that are perpendicular to the river cost, let's see, the fencing material is going to cost $5 per linear foot. And the fencing for the other side costs $10 per linear foot. Okay, so suppose you have $450 to spend on fencing find the dimensions of the total region 
that will produce the maximum area. So it's a little weird for me, oops, I highlighted too much. It's a little weird for me to use a highlighter here because so much of the information that we're given um, uh, is, is important. So if you, if you go through these questions like with a highlighter like I did, you might end up highlighting quite a bit of it. Okay, so um, in these notes, they're asking us, they've given us some sort of framework for how to start this question, but, uh, and the first thing they say is, uh, determine the function that describes the situation and write it in terms of one variable. Well, before you can determine your function for a question like this, you actually probably want to draw a picture. So that's some of the, that's where a lot of this information, these words, are really leading us. They're giving us a lot of information so that we can draw a picture. So it says we're going to build a rectangular region. So let me sort of draw that. So there's my rectangular region. And what they told me is it's along the straight side of a river. So there's some river and I'm gonna fence in a river, sorry, fence in a rectangular region along the, the river. But there's one other thing I should say. I'm going to break this up into two pieces. So maybe I'll have these. Okay. And here's what they tell us. The material we're using to build my fence um, is going to cost $5 per foot. They say per linear foot, just to give us some more syllables to think about. Um, so uh, what they mean is, you know, per foot. So $5 per foot. Um, but that's only for the fencing that's perpendicular to uh, the river. So if I look at my picture, this is where my picture really starts to help. This part of the fence and this part of the fence and this third part of the fence, that all cost $5 per foot. Then there's that fourth side of the fence, um, maybe here. This one, we're going to use more expensive fencing. This cost $10 per foot. Okay, so we have a budget for this little word problem. However we design this rectangular and divided region, we can only spend $450 to spend on the fencing. What is the dimensions of the total region that will provide the maximum area? So let's, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw my picture again because I've drawn over it a little bit. I've got this river right here, and I'm going to make some sort of rectangular region like this. And I might make this region really, really long or really, really narrow, right? Um, so what I'm interested in is what's the total area of, the, of, the, of both of these rectangles? And here's where, before we get a function involved, we draw a picture, right? This is sort of my first step is to say, draw a picture, and then give names to some relevant parts of the, of the picture. So for example, I'm probably going to go ahead and call this length x, and this length over here I'm going to call y. And so what do we have? This is where we can get a function that we're interested in. The total area of the region we've created is going to be x times y. All right, so, so far all of this has come about just from carefully reading, drawing a picture, and writing down some names for variables. And now we have an expression. We want to make this as big as possible. We want to maximize this quantity. There's a problem with us wanting to maximize this, of course. We want to maximize this, but this function, 
you could call this a, this function has two variables, an x variable and a y variable. And our techniques from chapter three were only um, able to apply them to functions of one variable. This is really common for these optimization questions. You will read carefully these word problems, set things up, and you almost always get a function that has two or even three variables in it. Your next step is to use information from the problem to get the variables down to one variable. So what information have I not written down yet? I haven't written down the fact that my budget is $450. I haven't written down how much this fencing is going to cost me in terms of my variable X and Y. So this is where I go back to my picture and I say, okay, if X is the length of that little part of the fence that I've labeled, I have three parts of that. I have three parts that have an X. I can even come over here and write them all in red. And each one of those parts of the fence, I'm using material that costs $5 per foot. And so each of those has X feet. So the cost there would be, well, I have three X's and then I multiply that by five, because it's five dollars times the length of those pieces. And then I have plus, well, I have one piece that's Y feet long, and I'm using ten dollars for that. So here's how my cost is actually information. My cost, I was told, is four hundred and fifty dollars. And so this is 15x plus 10y. So you see how when I give my picture variable names, then I can set up my cost information and I get it, it gives me an equation. You can pick whichever variable you want to get rid of. Let's say we want to get rid of y. So I'm going to solve this equation for y. It's going to be 450 minus 15x equals 10y. And then let me keep solving this for y. If I divide through by 10, I'll get y equals 45 minus 3 halves x. And why is this helpful? Because the function I'm trying to maximize, that area function, has an x and a y in it. But I can now go plug this expression in for y. And when I do that, I'll get an area function that has one variable. I can even give it a name. I'll say a of the single variable x for the area of x is x times 45 minus 3 halves x. And if I multiply that all out, I'll get 45x minus 3 halves x squared. So I want to point out what this particular um, example has for a step one, in my opinion, actually consists of several steps. And I'll review them again after we complete this example. But after we executed all those steps, this question now becomes a calculus question tell me the maximum value of this function I've called a of x. Well, as step two sort of tells us, to find a maximum, we're going to take a derivative. So the derivative of this function would be 45 minus 3x. And then, of course, we're going to set it equal to 0 right because that's where we think our maximums might happen at our critical numbers and so when I solve this for X I get I actually find just one critical number X equals 15 now as we know maybe this critical number is a maximum maybe it's a minimum maybe this will give us the smallest area if we use 15 feet for X 
or maybe it'll be neither. And that's what step three is about. It says, hey, make sure you actually found a maximum. Verify this is going to be a maximum. Well, here, if you want this function, it's pretty easy to use the second derivative test. So the second derivative is actually just the constant negative three. So when I plug in my critical number, really when I plug in any number, including the critical number, I get negative three, which of course is negative. The second derivative is negative. That tells me we're concave down. So that tells me this critical number, x equals 15, does give me a maximum output. Okay, so let's now answer the question. The question was, under all these conditions, tell us the dimensions of the total region that will provide the maximum area. So that is, tell me x, we just found that, and tell me y. So we know that if we pick x equal to 15, and plug that into our area function, that's where we'll get the maximum area. But what's the y value? Well, we had already solved for y. y is the expression 45 minus 3 halves x. And so now I'm going to plug that 15 in for x to figure out what my y value is. That'll be 45 minus 45 over 2, that'll be 45 halves. So what are the total dimensions of this giant divided spin? The total dimensions, we're going to make a 15 foot by 45 halves foot or 22.5 foot rectangle. And what's the area? Well, now we can say, okay, and the maximum area we get will be a of x equals 15. Well, I'm just going to multiply x and y. So that'll be 15 times 45 all divided by 2. And I guess I'll use a calculator. Just cheat off to the side here figure out that 15 times 45 is 675 all divided by 2 that'll be feet squared okay so let me summarize what we did here before going on to another type of example so what was our sort of problem, this sort of optimization word problem technique. Um, word problem steps. Well, I'm going to say step zero, sort of really important step, might be to draw a picture. Right, so a lot of these word problems are going to be kind of visual in nature, so you're going to want to sort of sketch a picture. And then I think the second step is label important parts of your picture. Really, what we're saying here is give names to, to variables. And then a common next step is to write down the function you want to optimize. Now in our previous example, example one, we ended up with a function that we were trying to make as big as possible. But in different applications, we might end up with something we're trying to make as small as possible. So that's why I'm using this more general word, optimize. I don't necessarily always want to maximize something. I might want to maximize in some problems or minimize 
in other problems. A really important next step is to use additional information to write your function so that it has one variable. So in example one above, right, we had this area function which had two variables in it, and we had to use that cost information to get an equation involving those two variables, and that's what let us get rid of one of the variables. Once we've done steps zero through three, then I could just sort of be a jerk and say, and now do calculus, right? But I'll be a little more specific, so I'll be a specific or specifying jerk. What I mean by do calculus now is now take a derivative, solve for critical numbers, and so I'm cramming a lot of steps into step four, and test the critical number. A last step that I'll mention, right, is we want to sort of interpret the results. We want to actually sort of say, hey, after I got through step four, did I actually answer the question, right? So like in example one just above, I could have stopped and said, oh, X is 15. But that's not what the question was asking for. It was saying, what is X and Y? So I needed to also find Y. Um, but there's something I want to point out about interpreting the results. Um, you also sort of want to check the meaningfulness of your results. So from step four, you might get critical numbers that make sense for your formula, but when you actually plug them in, they might give you like a negative cost or a negative area. And those sorts of things are signs that, oh, maybe I shouldn't consider those critical points. So we'll see, we'll keep an eye to see if that happens with any of these other examples. All right, so let's try an example that's here. This is a pretty standard type of example. And thankfully, this one comes with a picture. So they've sort of given us step zero from my summary. Example two says, if you cut away equal squares from all four corners of a piece of cardboard, so that's what's happening in this picture down below. They're saying, let's take this piece of cardboard and cut corners off of it. Then what you can do is once you remove those square corners, you can fold the flaps up and you'll get an open top box. So the problem says, suppose you start with a piece of cardboard that measures, um, so a piece of cardboard that measures three feet by eight feet. Find the dimensions of the open box that will give a maximum volume. And then it asks, hey, and what is that maximum volume? Okay, so here they gave us a picture and I'm gonna label some information on this picture. They did tell us that the cardboard we're starting with measures, oops, wrong, wrong marker, measures, um, let's see, they said three feet by eight feet. So that we know. Okay, what else do we need to label in this picture? Well, we probably want to give a name to the amount that we're removing um, at each corner. Like how big is that square? That's where you get to pick. Is it as small as they've indicated? Or you could remove a bit more, right? Maybe this red one. So there's a variable amount there and we should give that variable a name. Well, the side of one of those squares, I'll just call X. You could call S, you could call Y, it's really just a name. But since that's a square, 
the other side there is x. And since they told me that this is all equal squares, these are all the same x's everywhere. Okay, so um, something that's sort of uh, uh, that we need to think about here is when I make this picture, when I fold this box up, right, all the X stuff in the folded picture goes away. And so what I have here is I have some amount here and I have some other amount here, right? Now these amounts used to be, the long one used to be eight, the short one used to be three, but now I've trimmed away some squares of side length x from each side. And if you think about it, this new side length has to be eight minus two x. Right, why is it eight minus two x? Well, look in this picture on the left, how much is this part between these two blue marks that I've made? The whole thing used to be eight, but I came in x on the left and I came in x on the right. So I came in by two x's. Similarly, for the other side length, it's gonna be three minus two x. And then one other thing we should label on this three-dimensional box that we folded is, what's the height of that box? And if you really think about it, the height has to be x. That's how much we folded up, and those little squares had side length x. And so for this problem, we get a function, the volume, it's going to turn out to be a function of just one variable. Volume is just length times width times height. So length times width times height. One interesting thing about this optimization problem is it did not involve more than one variable. So the that first or second step I described of using the additional information to get rid of a variable doesn't apply here. This function is ready to go. We're ready to do calculus on this. We want to find the maximum value of this volume function v of x. And so now we can use calculus. We can say, well, let's do some differentiating. And let's see if I can differentiate this. I guess I'll do some product rules. So that'll be minus two times three minus two x times x plus eight minus two x times a negative two times x plus eight minus two x times three minus two x. And what I probably need to do is multiply this stuff out uh, and collect like terms, right? So V prime, let's see, if I distribute this X and this negative two, that'll be negative six X for the first one, and then plus four X squared. And then I'll have minus 16 X and then I'll have um, plus another 4x squared. And then this last term in my derivative will be 8 times 3 is 24. And 8 times negative 2 is negative 16x. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6x. And finally, negative 2x times negative 2x is a positive 4x. About 4x squared, sorry. Uh, 
All right, so let me write a simpler version of this function. We will find that v prime equals, let's see if I can try to make room here. Uh, the 4x squared, I have 3 4x, so I'll have a 12x squared. So I'll have v prime equals 12x squared. That came from combining this 4x squared that I erased and this, this one and this one. And then I have a bunch of x's. I have a negative 16x and a negative 6x, and I have those t t uh, two other times. So I have, let's see, negative 12 plus negative 32, negative 44x, if I combine that correctly. So those combine to give me negative 44x. And then I have this plus 24. I'll just write it a little closer. Okay, so a little bit of algebra suffering, and we get to this. Um, I think it would be nice. I notice I can factor out a 12 from everything. So that would be 12 times x squared. Oh, wait, you can't. Sorry, not from that. I can factor out a 4 from everything. Um, 4. So I'd have 3x squared. Um, minus 11x plus 6. And what I want to do is I'm trying to find the maximum output of v, so I want to set this equal to 0 to find a critical number. All right, so here's where, um, excuse me, here's where we can absolutely use either um, the quadratic formula uh, or um, maybe we can factor this uh, expression. So uh, let's see here. Hi, sorry, the video I was making, I accidentally closed the window and it stopped recording. So I'm right back where we were, where I was saying we want to find the um, the roots of this degree 2 thing, and we can do that either by factoring it um, or by using the quadratic equation. And it turns out we get two roots here. We get x equals 2 thirds, and we also get x, um, I believe, equals three. Okay, so the only reason I'm skipping the quadratic equation there is just to save space. Um, because like in the previous example, uh, we actually have two critical points. We actually want to make sure we pick a maximum here. Should we make x, if we go to this picture up above, should we make x two-thirds or should we make x x3, right? Or should we trim away 3 or should we trim away 2 thirds? It's not so clear. Um, but one thing I will say is we can use the second derivative test because v is just a polynomial. So the second derivative becomes pretty nice. v double prime equals 4 times 6x minus 11. And so if I check, if I ch check the second derivative at the critical point two thirds, then I'll have four and six times two thirds will be four. And then I have minus 11. So this will be negative, which will tell me it's a maximum. So probably, Probably the critical point I want is this one. That's going to be where my max happens. Um, if I check the other critical point just to be sure, I'll have 4 times 6 times 3 is 18 minus 11. 18 minus 11 is 7. So that's going to be positive, right? So we're concave up. So we actually have a minimum. So we don't want this one. This would be a minimum. OK. 
Okay. Um, so, okay, so now we found that the value of x has to be two thirds. And so now we want to remind ourselves, oh, we want to find the volume of this thing. Well, if you go back to our picture, the side lengths were x, so that's the height, but we also had eight minus two x was one length. So this would be eight minus four thirds. So this will be 20 over three. And our other one was three minus two x. So this will be three minus four thirds, which will be five thirds. So if you want to talk about the dimensions, this would be a 20 over three by five over three by three feet box. So these are the dimensions and the volume. Well, we could plug in two thirds into our volume function. That's just going to multiply these numbers. We're going to get, oop, I said three, sorry. Okay, so those are the dimensions. So the volume would be um, 20 thirds times 5 thirds times 2 thirds. So when I multiply all that stuff together, 20 times 5 is 100, 100 times 2 is 200. So that's 200 divided by 27 cubic units of volume. Okay. All right, here's another question. Uh, this one is again about making a box and here's what's going on with this one. It says an open top rectangular box um, with a square base is to be built so that it holds 32 cubic feet. What should the dimensions be in order to minimize the cost of materials used to build this box. Okay, so this one, we're gonna start with a picture. So we're going to, you don't have to be a great artist to, to do these, but we're gonna make some sort of open top box like this. And here's the thing, it said it's a square base so this shape down at the bottom is supposed to be a square. So if I follow my steps and start labeling things, maybe I'll make the side lengths, I'll call them X. So it's a square, so they're all, they're all X. And then I have a second variable in this one. How tall do I make the box? And I guess I'll call that Y. So this question, um, again, what we're trying to minimize is the cost of the material used to build this box. And that's a little vague, I think, but once you draw a picture, what you realize is this box is made up of five pieces. It's made up of this wall piece, and then this wall piece, and then there's another one back over here. And then there's this wall piece. And then finally we have our base piece. So we have five pieces. Maybe I'll try and shade them in a little bit. So we have these five pieces here. There's my base. And maybe these are my sides and green. And so let's say you're making this material out of cardboard, then the fewer amount of cardboard you use, the smaller you can make those green and pink pieces, then the less it'll cost you. So when they say minimize the cost of materials, what they're really saying in a problem like this is minimize surface area. So that's, we want to get a, a function that represents surface area. So let's think about this. 
once I've drawn a picture, it, it actually is pretty helpful because the base piece is a square of side length x. So the surface area for the base piece is just how much area that pink guy has, which is just x times x for area. Now one of the green pieces, let me pick on this one over here, it has side length x and it has a height y. So what's the area of that one green piece? That should just be plus um, x times y. That's one of my green pieces. But how many green pieces do I have? Well, I have four sides here, so I have four of those. And you might be wondering, wait a minute, you forgot the lid, right? That, if, if I were including the lid, that would be another x squared piece that fits on top. But they did tell us in the problem that this is an open top box. So there's no, um, there's no lid to put on it. So here is the function that we're trying to minimize in this problem. We want to minimize x squared plus 4xy. This is what we're trying to make small. Of course, this has too many variables in it. We need to use additional information so to get this down to one variable. And what's the additional information? It was this up here. We were told that the box that we're building has to hold 32 cubic feet. If you think about what that's saying, that's telling us that the volume of the box has to be 32 cubic feet. And I know how to compute the volume, just like we did in the previous problems. That's length times width, so that's in the base, so that's x times x, times height. So this is my extra information I can use to solve for either x or y. It really doesn't matter which one you solve for, but if you have this information to use, you might as well make your life easier and solve for whatever variable is maybe easiest to solve for. So in my case, I claim it's easier to solve for y, because all I have to do is divide by x squared. And now, everywhere I see the variable y, I can go and plug them into my surface area function. So my surface area function, which I'll just call s, probably be s of x, will be x squared plus 4x times 32 all over x squared. That's the function that I need to make very small. And so let's, let's actually write this function out a little bit more simplified. This will be the function x squared plus, let's see, 4 times 32 is 128. And then I can cancel one of those x's. And of course, we can rewrite this as one as x squared plus 128 x to the negative one. All right, so seriously, look at this question. It took a bit of reading, a careful bit of sketching and thinking, but all of the new work goes into getting this function. And now you just say, okay, tell me where that function is smallest. So now we just let calculus take over. We just say, well, let's take a derivative. I will get 2x minus 128 times x to the negative 2. And I want to set that equal to 0. And here's where what I called step 5, so I guess it's a little out of order, might come in, right? When I say, when, when we looked for critical points from chapter 3, yes, we would often set the first derivative equal to 0, but we would also look at where the first derivative was undefined. So here I would notice, hey, this derivative, this is really 2x minus 128 divided by x squared, and that's all 0. That's undefined when x equals 0. So you might be tempted to say, I've got a critical number. 
x equals 0 makes this undefined, but this is what I meant by my comment as part of quote unquote step 5. We really want to interpret how meaningful this is. Because if I go back to this question, if x is 0, then I really don't even have a real box. So it's true, we can think about x being 0 in terms of this as a formula, but in terms of the real real world question we're working on, x equals 0 doesn't make sense. So I really don't even have to worry about x being 0. I just want to solve this equation for x. And if I rearrange this equation, I get, let's see, um, 2x cubed equals 128. And if I divide by 2, I get x cubed equals 64. And if I take a cube root, I believe I get x equals 4. So I found one critical number. And you could say x equals 0 is critical, but I found one meaningful critical number. And here's what often happens in these questions. You find one meaningful critical number, and you really, really hope it gets you what you're after, a minimum in this case. Well, we can verify that we have a minimum, say, by using the second derivative test. So if I use the second derivative, or if I compute the second derivative, I'm going to get 2 plus, um, oh, 2 times 128 is 256, x to the negative 3. And here's the point, when I plug in 4, I'm going to get some big number, but all I really care about is that the second derivative is positive, so that we're con concave up, and we know we have a min. So this has to be a minimum. So we found we set up this question very carefully. We said if we want to minimize the volume we can get from this scenario, we should use x equals 4. And so we know that x equals 4, but since we're looking for the dimensions of this box, we should go and find out what the height or the y value is. And y was 32 divided by x squared. So that's 32 divided by 16, so that's 2. So this box will be a 4 foot by 4 foot by 2 foot box. That will enclose um, 32 cubic units of volume, and it will have as small surface area as possible. Okay, this is a good question, um, because if we set it up uh, sort of in a straightforward way, we'll be able to do it, but it'll make the problem look um, harder than it needs to look. So just giving you a warning, I'm going to do a quote-unquote trick to keep our work as simple as we can. Okay, but let's just start with the question. Example 4 says, find the points on this graph of this parabola, and it's a graph of the parabola y equals 4 minus x squared that is closest to the point 0 comma 2. So let me go ahead and mark this point 0 comma 2. Here's the point x is 0, y is 2. It should be right there. So you can probably do this question by inspection, right? But here's what's happening in this question. Here's what it's really saying. It says, take a point somewhere on this parabola and look at the line that connects that point to 0, 2, how long is that line? Go ahead and take out a ruler and measure it. And now pick another point on this parabola and do the same thing. Make a line to 0, 2 and tell me how long that is. Right, so what we want to do is we want to figure out um, which point or points on this parabola is closest to that orange dot 0 comma 2. So points on the parabola, right, we might call x comma y, and we want to know the distance from x comma y to this point 0 comma 2. 
And thankfully, they reminded us of the distance formula here. The distance between two points in the plane, I subtract their x values, so that'll be x minus 0 all squared, so that'll just be an x squared, x minus 0 all squared, and then a plus, and then I'll have a, oh, I'll use a different color than that, y minus 2 all squared. So that'll be a y minus 2 all squared. OK, so this is the function. I'll just start calling the function maybe d, or referring to it as d right now for distance. Um, this is the function we want to make as small as possible. And we are going to have to use some information to get rid of one of the variables. But before we do that, I just want to make a quick comment on what you might think of as a quote unquote trick. It's not much of a trick. It's really an acknowledgement. So mathematicians and physicists, um, we tend to dislike square roots. It's not that square roots are bad. It's just that they're kind of ugly. And if we can avoid them, we prefer to. Um, so you maybe thought you were the only person who felt that way about square roots, but you're not. Uh, it's sort of a professional technique to be on the lookout for when can I get rid of square roots? And so this is a situation where we don't actually need this ugly looking square root. Instead, we can get rid of this um, by uh, by noticing that if we minimize instead of distance, if we say which point doesn't have the minimum distance to that orange point, but which point has the minimum distance squared, well, that's the same thing as minimizing distance. In fact, this is a common thing that pops up in a lot of areas of math. We might set up a problem as wanting to find a minimum distance and a lot of times we'll say oh let's minimize the distance squared instead so the real function we're going to use i'll just start calling it f it's the distance squared and it's just x squared plus y minus 2 all squared so by using this trick i'm going to say this is the function we want to minimize well I still need to get it down to one variable. But first, I might as well say, well, might as well get rid of that square root. OK, so let's answer question one, which is, all right, how do I get this function down to one variable? Well, the one information I haven't used yet is that the points I'm looking at, right, these points that I've drawn, and now these new ones that I'm drawing, they aren't just anywhere in the plane. They have to be on this parabola. So my point x, y, whose distance squared to 0, 2 I'm looking at, is on the parabola. And that's information. That is the same thing as saying the y value is 4 minus x squared. And so now, everywhere I see a y, I can replace that. And so my function f becomes this function x squared plus y, which is 4 minus x squared, minus 2, all squared. And I can simplify that a tiny bit more. That's x squared plus um, 2 minus x squared, all squared. So this is the function that I should try to minimize. It now has one variable. I can now use calculus on this. So let's take a derivative of this guy to see if we can find some critical numbers. f prime of x will be equal to 2x plus 2 times 2 minus x squared, all times the derivative of 2 minus x squared, so negative 2x. 
And I'm going to set that equal to 0, but before I do, maybe I'll try and factor out a 2x from everything. So I'll be left with a 1 minus 2 times 2 minus x squared. And I want to set that equal to 0. And so let me rewrite that stuff in, in the brackets a little, little nicer. That's 1 minus... Um, 1 minus 4 plus x squared, and so that's x squared minus 3. So I find three x values that makes this derivative 0. I find x can equal 0, x can equal the square root of 3, or x can equal the negative square root of 3. Okay, so now, um, <coughs> excuse me, now we want to look at which one of these critical numbers gives us a minimum, and let's verify that. So again, I, I could use like a sign diagram for the first derivative test here. That would work just as well. Um, but maybe, maybe what I'll do is rewrite f prime a little. This now looks like 2x cubed, if I remultiply that all out, minus 6x. And so now for the next part, if I want to use the second derivative test, I'll get... 6x squared minus 6. Otherwise known as 6 times x squared minus 1. So I can use that second derivative to test these critical numbers. f double prime of 0 is going to be negative 6. So that's actually going to be... Second derivative is negative, so I'm concave down. So that's actually going to be a maximum f double prime of the square root of 3, that's going to be 6 times 2, that's going to be 12, so that's going to be a minimum. And then my other critical point to check is negative square root of 3, which if you carefully plug into the second derivative is also 12, so you also have a minimum. So we have two critical numbers x equals plus or minus the square root of 3 that we want to check. The other critical number, x equals 0, is actually a local maximum for this distance. So, what are the closest points? Well, let's actually see. Let's actually say, okay, when x equals square root of 3, well, we already know that the y value is 4 minus x squared, so that'll be 4 minus 3, that'll be 1. So here's the point root 3, comma 1. And we could say, all right, what is the distance squared right, of this point to the origin? So I've got a, sorry, not to the origin, to the point uh, 0, comma 2. So we've got a right so x squared plus 2 minus x squared squared. Oops, sorry. So x squared plus 2 minus x squared squared. So when I plug in um, square root of 3 into my distance squared function, I get 3 plus 2 minus 3 all squared, and that's going to be 4. So the distance squared from this point, root 3, comma 1, to the point we cared about, 0, 2, the distance squared is 4, so the distance is 2. Similarly, when x is negative root 3, if you work out the y value, you also get 1, and you also get that the distance squared is 4. So we have two points that have the same um, distance squared. So there's two points that achieve this minimum, right? So the closest points are both of these, 
one of them is square root of 3 comma 1 and the second point is negative root 3 comma 1 and the distance squared to the point of interest for each of those is 4 so the distance to the point is 2 so if I go way back up to my parabola picture um, I've got to go to let's see y equals 1 let me kind of erase some stuff here um, yeah so y equals 1 I'll try and put these points in like red or something uh, and well okay so Sorry, I'll stop there. Stop there. I'm getting all confused. Okay, so those are the two points that are closest. Um, and I think we can try number five also. Another sort of example of this. Number five says, find the largest possible area for a rectangle with base on the x-axis and upper vertices on the same parabola, y equals 4 minus x squared. So, for example, um, what you're really trying to do is fit a rectangle into this parabola. And so you might pick this rectangle. It's got vertices on the parabola, and now its base is there. Maybe you want that purple rectangle, or maybe you want, I don't know, a taller rectangle that isn't as wide. Maybe you want this green rectangle, but you can see how there are a bunch of different rectangles you could pick. And the question is asking which one will have the largest possible area. Okay, so clearly, let me get rid of that purple one. I'll, I'll stick with the green stuff. Um, I'm gonna make some labels here. I'm going to label this part of the rectangle down here x, and its height I'm going to call y. And if you really think of those two labels for this rectangle, the area of this rectangle is not x times y. That would just be that would just be this part x times y. I need two times that, right? So the area is going to be 2xy. And of course, right, just the, I want to make this big. I want to maximize this. Um, and, uh, I need to have this in terms of one variable. Just like the problem before, right, this y value comes from this vertex up here, this corner up there, and that y value has to lie on this parabola. So we were told that y has to equal 4 minus x squared. And so the function we're really trying to maximize, we could write as a function of just the variable x, we can replace y with 4 minus x squared. So this will be 8x minus 2x cubed. And so now we just want to go and look for critical numbers here. So the derivative is going to be 8 minus 6x squared and I'll set that equal to zero. And now when I solve, start solving this, I will get that eight equals six X squared. If I divide by six um, and simplify, I will have four over three equals X squared. And so if I take a square root, I actually find two places. I get plus or minus two divided by root three equals x. 
And so you can either in this situation regard this as, oh, I'm going to have two critical points to check, or you can sort of start to interpret the meaningfulness of these critical points and say, well, yeah, clearly if, if I'm picking x equals a value over here, I could have picked x to be its negative, and I would have gotten the same rectangle. So really, I only need to check one of these for this question. So I really only need to look at one, but you're free to check both. Um, so I will look at x equals 2 over root 3. And now let's verify that I have a maximum. Well, um, I can, again, use the second derivative test, since these functions aren't too hard to differentiate. And the second derivative of a is just going to be negative 12x. And so when I plug in this weird but positive number there, right, I am going to get um, something, um, sorry, I am going to get a, a negative number. So I have a concave down area function. So, let's give me one second, sorry guys. Okay, sorry for that interruption. Um, I had to pause to go get the door. Where were we? Oh, I see. We were, right, so I was doing the second derivative test. Oh, I see what, I think there's a problem. Yeah, the second derivative turned out to be negative which means it's concave down, but I drew the situation as though it were concave up. Sorry about that. So concave down. So that tells me that I have a maximum. Okay, so when x equals this weird number, 2 over the square root of 3, I will get a maximum area. But what is the value of that maximum area? Well, I could go and plug that into my area of x function. a of x equals 2x times 4 minus x squared. So the area at this maximum will be 2 times 2 over root 3 times 4 minus 2 over root 3 squared. And so I can simplify this number a little bit. That's 4 over root 3 times, uh, that'll be 12 thirds minus 4 thirds, that'll be 8 thirds. And so I'll get that my maximum area looks something like 32 over 3 root 3. And if you're one of those weirdos who is prejudiced against having radicals in the denominator, then I guess I will endure indulge that. That'll be 32 root 3 all divided by 9. So that's the maximum area of a rectangle that you can fit under this parabola. Okay, let's see what other sorts of examples we have. Example 6 is a good one. I remember last spring there being a quiz question like this. So let's um, there's probably quiz questions on all these, but I just remember this one in particular. This one says, find the numbers a and b so that the function y equals a times x to the negative one-half plus b times x to the one-half has a minimum value of 6 at x equals 9. All right, well, let's not worry too much about this. Here's what we need to think about. We want y to have a minimum value at x equals 9. So we want y to have a minimum value at x equals 9. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us that we probably want x equals 9 to be critical. So we want the derivative at 9 to be 0. So we should probably write out the derivative. y prime of x equals negative a over 2 times x to the 
negative 1 half minus 1. So it'll be negative 3 halves plus b over 2 times x to the negative 1 half. Okay, let me rewrite this a little bit. The derivative looks like negative a divided by 2x to the 3 halves plus b divided by 2x to the 1 half. And so now, when I plug in 9, I'm supposed to get 0. So let's plug in 9. I will get negative a divided by 2 times 9 to the 3 halves plus b divided by 2 times 9 to the 1 half. And what's nice about the input 9 is I know how to take 1 half powers of it. 9 to the 1 half is 3. And so that 9 to the 1 half under the a becomes a 3. And then I cube the 3, so that's 27. 27 times 2 becomes a 54. And then I have a plus b over 2 times 3, so I get 6. So look what I learn. Just by telling me that y, that x equals 9 is a critical number, that's where a minimum value has to happen, I learn this equation that 0 equals negative a over 54 plus b divided by 6. And there's probably a couple different ways I could rewrite this. I could write b over 6 equals a over 54. And I could even multiply through by 54 on both sides and learn that 9 times b equals a. So here's something I learned. Okay, what else do I need um, to happen? Not only did they tell me that I have a minimum occurring at x equals 9, but they also told me the value there, that when x equals 9, the minimum value is supposed to be 6. So I can plug that in and say, okay, y of 9 is supposed to be a over 9 to the 1 half plus b times 9 to the 1 half. So let me keep writing that green equation down below. I learned that 6 equals a over 3 plus 3b. And if I multiply, just to get rid of fractions, everything by 3, I will learn that 18 equals a plus 9b. And so now look, this question really didn't follow my my um, steps that I mentioned at the beginning of these notes. Um, but this question said, hey, here's a function, but I'm not going to tell you all of its parts, right? It's got these missing numbers a and b, but I'll tell you it has a minimum at x equals 9, and the value there is 6. If we organize all that information using calculus, we find these two equations, the purple one and the green one, and we can solve these equations for a and b. So we can say solve these, I'm sorry, solve these for a and b. So equation one says a equals 9b, just rewriting it that way. And equation two says um, a plus 9b equals 18. So if I work with these equations, I actually can learn um, for example, into the second equation, I can call 9b a, so I get 2a equals 18, so I get a equals 9, and then from my first equation, that'll tell me b equals 1. So when we're all said and done, we were able to answer this question, we got that y equals 9x to the negative 1 half plus x to the one-half. We found a and b.
All right, so here are some extra ones that, that you guys can try on your own. It sort of walks through the same process. Um, these three, I was just scrolling through to double check, these three really do um, fit the description we offered at the beginning with that sort of five or six step plan. But okay, I am going to end this video, so thanks, and I hope you guys are continuing to do well.